want to echo what Lincoln and Jim talked about this this morning earlier in our services about our upcoming election. Um, it has been said that uh, voting is, is a privilege, but I believe as believers we have a responsibility. So I expect all of us to go out and to cast our vote because if believers are not influencing this world, then those that do not believe will influence this world. So please take the time uh, to build that into your schedule this Tuesday. I uh, also want to let you know that had the opportunity on Friday to go by the Learning Center. Uh, it is getting ready to crank up again on Monday. And uh, Mr. Art and Susan and Laurie Beth gave me a tour. And it is incredible. If you haven't been down there, um, the new location for it is on Governors at Bram. And it is a, a, a neat location that we've got a lot of square footage that's been given to us for a real reasonable amount. And it, it's not only going to be the Learning Center, but also it's, it's going to be the place we're doing our mercy ministry and also storing some of our disaster relief. So it really is going to become more of, of a hub for a lot of our outreach. So I encourage you uh, to be a part of that and to look into helping out. They need some people to cook meals and, and provide snacks in the afternoons, but also tutors. So the Lord has granted us an opportunity to get closer and closer to the people we're trying to serve. So I encourage us to look forward to doing that. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go back to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, and we're going to be taking a look at the parable of the ten minus, or perhaps yours says the parable of the pounds. Before we get to the powerful teaching from Jesus, it, it, it bears mentioning that Kenneth Bailey, as well as some other scholars I was reading this week, really said that in particular on this parable, we need to really realize that a lot of times we read stuff like this story through kind of the lens of our economic capitalistic system. And so we need to do the best we can, take a step back from that and say, well, how would this have been interpreted and understood by the people at, at the time when Jesus was speaking these things? So we're going to try to look not so much from a Western mindset, but what, was, what were the people, the, the Jews at the time, understanding of what Jesus is doing here? Well, this picks up right as... Uh, right where we left off last week, where salvation has just been brought to the home of Zacchaeus. And as Jesus proclaims this tax collector and his family are in, oh, man, that, that's incredible. And so the, right on the heels of this, Jesus is heading to Jerusalem for his final week. And then he's going to be crucified and raised again and after 40 days going to be taken up. And then it's theirs. He's handing this off. And he's saying, I'm going back to be with the Father. Let's see what happens, because there's no plan B. Plan A, my only plan is to hand what I've given, and, and you're going to take this gospel message, this love that I'm going to show on the cross, and this precious gift can be given to you, and it's up to you for it to continue growing and multiplying. So that's what this passage is about. So let's read together in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. While they were listening to this, his proclamation about Zacchaeus, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minus. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. Now, this is, is very similar to, to Matthew's telling of this, but I, I have to tell you, it's a little bit different. So I want us to, to look at, at the, the aspects that Luke puts, on, puts into this. So some scholars say this is even completely different than Matthew's telling. This is a whole different story, because I, I, but I, I don't want the two to bleed over to where we just think it's like Matthew's telling. So as the story begins, we've got this nobleman that's given a speech. And so he calls his servants together. And he says, I'm, I'm going to this distant country. And I'm going to make a case that I should be king over this land. And so I'm going to be gone. It's going to take some while to travel. And I don't know how long it, it's going to take for me to make, make my case and for them to kind of do some of the vetting and, and the process. But I, I promise you, I, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be crowned king over this land. 
this whole thing seems weird to us, but that's precisely what happens with Herod the Great in, in, uh, when, when he has to travel to Rome in 40 B.C. He goes and he says, I understand that Israel is under your occupation, but you still need a local that, that's ruling over things. And so he goes and petitions that I should be this person. I'm going to be a king. Now, in some ways, I'm going to be a figure, figurehead king because you're going to be calling the shots, but I still want to be the person that you talk with, the correspondence. So they talked about it for a while, and they said, okay, Herod, you can be king. Walk back in and say, Rome said it's okay. Now, his son uh, wasn't given the, the, the same title. But, so this is very fresh on their minds. But this nobleman in Jesus' parable is confident he's going to receive his appointment. But not everyone else agrees that he should be receiving this title of king. But nevertheless, the king calls together ten servants, and he gives them each ten minus. Now, uh, that, that's kind of a, a Greek term, but what it basically means is he's given them enough cash, the same amount of cash that a normal workman would make in about a third of the year, about 100 days labor, 100 days he's given it. So capital is really hard to, to come by, and so to have be flush with cash and, and be given this sack of money, this was a big deal. And so he, he goes and he gives this, and the NMI, in, in the NIV he tells them, put this money to work until I come back. In the English Standard Version it says, engage in business until I come. So in our Western mindset, we kind of think of a, a Donald Trump-like character that, that's calling together some potential people, his apprentices, and he's divided them up, and he says, oh, okay, I'm going to send you out with, this, with a lump sum of money, and, and here's your task, and that the team there doesn't per, uh, perform as well, someone on that team is going to hear the magical words, what? You're fired. You're fired. Okay, so there's doom. And, you know, we've got to produce. We, we've got to, to come up with this. And so that's kind of what, what we're thinking about. But the verse could also be interpreted as engage in trade because I'm coming back. It's kind of a subtle difference. Let me put this in a modern day setting so we can kind of get what I think Luke is trying to bring out in this story of Jesus. Imagine uh, Muhammad Hosni Mubarak, the former president of, of Egypt, and it's his last days of power. And can you imagine he gets together some of his servants and he says, I know that you've heard some of the turmoil happening outside the palace. In fact, we've been uh, kind of quarantined in here, so to speak, and, and surrounded. I'm getting ready to go off and take a little vacation well-deserved. Okay, so I'm going to go do this. And I know it appears this whole Arab Spring thing is not going my way. And sure, I admit I have a few enemies, but do not fear. I'm going to come back into power. In fact, I've, I've ruled over Egypt for almost 30 years. Don't worry about that. I'm going to prevail. But until then, I'm going to give you some of the king's treasures. And so here's a big pile of cash. And what I want you to do is go into downtown Cairo with this capital, and I want you to open up a business in my name. Why not Mubarak's mufflers or Hosni's hosiery? Yeah, something like that. Something that bears my name. Something that shows you're with me. Even though I'm off and I'm doing something else, I want people to know you're my servants, that we're, we're connected here. And when I get back, I'll, I'll check in on you when I return. What would you do with the money when Mubarak skips town? What are you going to do? Well, the plot thickens here because it says in Luke 19, verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be king. I don't think he's talking directly about the servants that have been given this money, but as they kind of do a straw poll around town, he doesn't have a whole lot of people that are willing to follow him at this time. It's not the popular thing that's out on the streets. But he says, I still want you to follow after me. And so these servants have got to figure it out. And so when you add in this element of kind of political instability, the only sensible thing to, and prudent thing to do was to take this money and just kind of put it on hold to bury it, so to speak, until you figure out which way the prevailing winds are going to blow. Is it going to be the nobleman that steps up, or is it going to be someone that's in opposition to him, his known enemies? 
Those two camps are both up for election. And so, man, do, do I go and declare here or do I kind of wait? Do I kind of waver here? A few years ago, our small group was hosting a Super Bowl party. And we had most of the guys were in there watching the, the TV. And some of the moms were as, as well. But there was another group, there was another group just kind of talking, not really engaged at all. And, and the kids, well, I hate to tell you, they were kind of running amok. We weren't really paying attention. They're all kind of doing their thing. What was interesting is, is, you know, every time we, we'd kind of shout and, and cheer or, or some big play would happen, one of the little girls would come in and, and she would say, who's winning? What's the score? How, how much time's left? And then about 30 minutes later, she'd come back in, who, who's, who's winning now? And well, what's, what's the score? You know, and, and after about the third time, her father said, honey, you don't really care much about this game. Why do you keep coming to get these updates? And she says, well, once I know who's going to win, then I can tell people that's who I'm for. And, and it's true. And, and with this delegation that's following the nobleman, no one knows how this is going to turn out. And so the servants are kind of caught there in a lurch. But by giving this money out, in essence, what the nobleman is, is trying to say is, are you willing to risk openly declaring your allegiance that you're with me while I'm out of town, when I'm away from you? Are you going to be my loyal servants during my absence when there is a popular sentiment that many oppose me in my rule? People are taking sides here, and I'm asking you, are you on my side or are you not? I had the opportunity to spend some time this past week with Scott Martin's brother, Carl, who lives over in Istanbul, Turkey. And we were playing in a, a golf scramble together, and so I, I was intrigued. I said, you know, Carl, what, what's that like? He said, well, I'll just tell you that I'm in a place with 4,000 believers in a country of 72 million people that don't believe. 4,000 versus 72 million. So in essence, he says, I'm, I'm like I'm on an island in a sea of Islam. That's what it's like, and that's where his family is. And so he's living in a world where the majority of the people around him say, we don't believe what you believe, and we don't believe in the teachings, and we're certainly not going to put ourselves under the rule of the person you say is your master. What an incredible place to live. What an incredible place to raise your children. Talk about convictions that you've got to have if you're standing up for that. It says the nobleman it is handing out the bags of coins to his servants. In essence, he's saying, once I have returned, and I'm going to, and, and I have this kingly power, I know it to be true, then it's going to be easy for you to say, oh yeah, I was with you all along. That's not what I'm interested in. I want you to declare now. I want you to engage in business on, on publicly and, and declare you're on my team because I'm much more interested in how you conduct yourselves in my absence where it's not as easy because there's a high price to pay if you openly declare this is who I'm with. That's the price I want you to pay. One of the benefits of working in Houston, Texas, our church was closely aligned with EEM, which stands for Eastern European Missions. And what was interesting working with Eastern European Missions is it, it, it was incredible to see how uh, they had been invited just recently, in the past few years, into the Ukrainian schools. Okay, So the, what was happening is within the schools, when they were totally living a, a secular existence, over in these Eastern Bloc countries, they saw the morality just go into the tank. And so they said, we've got to, to do something. So they have invited Eastern European missions to provide them with Bibles and faith-based curriculum to change the hearts of their children, to hopefully change their nation, which is just incredible since in America we're trying to do the exact opposite. But what was interesting watching this is they said, we want to change the hearts of our people away from the communist propaganda. And so as you start talking with these people, it, it's very encouraging to see their passion and what they choose to do with this awesome uh, opportunity and this mission. But I have a lot of respect for all the people that are involved with the EM, but I also have 
a, a greater level of respect for those that have been working pre-1991. Because in 1991, that's when the Iron Curtain came down. And the ministry changed dramatically. It, and instead of, of, of saying, please come in, at, at that point, it was illegal. And so you have people that are working for Eastern European mission that are literally putting their life on the line as they're carrying suitcases full of Bibles. Because the message of EEM is the Bible. We want everyone to get it. You see the, how, how that changes? You, you see what it means when, when you're carrying Bibles across and your life is on the line? Luke 19 and verse 15. Let's see what happens. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for his servants, whom he had given the money, in order to find out what they had gained with it. Well, in spite of the best efforts of the delegation to dissuade those are, that are power brokering and are trying to make this decision, he was crowned king. And so he begins checking in the, with the servants, and that becomes his, his, his first order of business is on day one is, okay, let, let's kind of see what's been happening here. Well, well, key to understanding what he's after is the Greek word dipragmatisado. Kind of a long word, and it's a mouthful. But in, in interpreting this word in the Greek, the Syriac, Coptic, and most of the Arab, Arabic versions take a different stance than what a lot of Western texts have. What they have interpreted is how much business has been transacted. I know I'm getting off in the weeds, but this is important for us. Most of the Western texts read how much has been gained by trading. See, in kind of our versions, in, in our mindset, uh, when, when we're focused on this, we're looking at results. Show me the cash. Show me the re results of what's been happening. But the former is seeking to discover the extent to which they've gone out and conducted business in his name. It's not as much on, on results. It's how much have you gone out and, do, uh, and done? So he's asking to see their ledgers, not to see the results, but he wants to see activity. He wants to see what you've been up to. Have you openly gone out while it's been risky for you to do so in my name? So he calls them to take a look and to assess the level of activity in public exposure. So it, it, it's a lot more, as we're going to see, about faithfulness than it is about revenues. Let's look at Luke 19, verses 16 through 19. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minus more. He said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little. You shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, uh, Lord, your, your mina has made five minas. He said to him, and you are to be over five cities. So in, in, in both cases, what, what he's affirming here and commending them is for being faithful for getting out there, for openly declaring, uh, this is my master. It may not be popular, but this is who I represent. So this is who, is, they've made a, a decision to be out there. And, and their reward is not bonuses based off their results. What they're given is more responsibility. This was a test to see if you're, you're loyal and, and a subject that can be trusted, that I can bring into my administration and put over greater things because you proved your faithfulness to me. Secondly, notice that the source of the benefits and the multiplied minus, the minus themselves, it, it's, it's like the gift has been put out there, and it's the gift that the faithful servants have just put out there that has produced the results. Let's read again in verse 20. Then another servant came and said, um, Sir, uh, here's your mina. I, I kind of kept it laid away in a piece of cloth, and I was afraid of you, because you're a hard man. You take what you do not put in, and, and, and reap you don't sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking what I do not put in, reaping what I do not sow, why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I come back, I could have collected it with interest? So in, in, in addition to admitting his inactivity, I've done nothing. I, I've just kind of wrapped this thing up. I've kind of held my own. At least I didn't lose anything. 
he outright declares, I haven't been out there on your behalf. No one knows of my allegiance because the gift that's been given to me has been wrapped up and held in secret. Well, I've got it. I, I've got this wonderful thing from the master. But no one out there is going to know what I've got. I've been holding it, but not trading for it in public. I read a recent article in the Washington Post that's discussing the campaign contributions in this res, uh, recent presidential election. And, and by the way, it's far and above what any other election has been. An incredible amount of money has, has changed hands in order to promote these candidates. And so in this Washington Post article, it, it talked about the, the top givers for the Obama uh, campaign and, and for the Romney campaign. What was interesting is buried in the article was a list of, of Wall Street companies and firms that have given equally to both candidates. And so they're, they're hedging their bets. So no matter what happens on Tuesday, they can say, huh, remember me? I gave to your campaign. I see a lot of us trying to do that. The nobleman responds by convicting the servant with his own words. Do you see me as a ruthless man? And, and by the way, he doesn't admit to that, but he says, if this is the way you see me as a ruthless man, you know, pillaging and plundering from others, should that not inspire you? If I'm a ruthless guy, as you say that I am, that should inspire you even more to align yourself with me. At the bare minimum, you should have stuck it in the bank to collect interest. Luke 19 and verse 24, then he said to those standing by, take his mind away from him and give it to the one who has ten. <laughs> Sir, they said he already has ten. Here, if I tell you that everyone who has will be given more, but for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. You know, it, it doesn't seem unfair to us, but what Jesus is saying is the one who responds in faithfulness, that's what I'm looking for. Not results, I'm looking for faithfulness. Are you out there on my behalf? That's the person that's going to receive greater and greater gifts. You know, it's, it's pretty awesome. You, you look at some people that are, are in more high-profile uh, ministries within this church, and you're like, wow, that's awesome. You know, look at, at where they started. The ministries that, that they chose to be a part of, the way that they've served over the years, and God has honored that. But the one that proves unfaithful what was given, with, with, the, with the gifts that have been squandered, those get taken away. Well, what's kind of driving this, this insecurity of, of should, I, should I get involved or should I not? It, it's fear of the public. The public and, and the enemies have put themselves up against the master. So what happens of the nobleman's enemies? In verse 27, but those enemies in mind who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here, kill them in front of me. To tell you, this is one of those awkward texts, especially if we kind of view that Jesus is a nobleman, which I do. I, I'm not going to try to explain it away, but I, I do think we need to balance it with what Luke has said earlier in his gospel. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, he says, But love your enemies and do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. But he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. The, the text tells us the enemies deserved, uh, deserve to have their heads lopped off. Whether that happens or not, it, it's a parable. Jesus leaves it open-ended. Well, what about us? What do we take from this story? Well, I believe that just like the servants in here, we've all been given gifts, haven't we? Talents opportunities I went to the awesome presentation last night on Israel and just to hear some of the struggles that Christians even over in Israel go through once they publicly declare who they are man it's incredible the hardships they go through and, and because we live in a free country we should be that much more vocal shouldn't we just because at least not yet. It, it, it's, we're free to, to share about our faith, at least for the time being. Should we not be doing that more? 
sometimes if we don't have that opposition, sometimes we take a step back, but that's not the way it should be. We've been given gifts, and Jesus did return to his heavenly Father. He's been enthroned, sitting at God's right-hand side. I firmly believe that. And the time is coming, the time is coming where he's going to come back judgment's going to be pronounced and he's going to come to to deal with his servants both the righteous and the unrighteous and he's also going to to take care of the master's determined enemies at that time that day is is coming so how do we respond in in light of these realities the the first is we're called to be visible we're called to visible faithfulness to our invisible master Simply put, he expects us to proclaim our allegiance to him in all we do. He expects us, expects us to get out there in, in our words, in, in our deeds, and the things that, that we're passionate about. And it, our life testimony should proclaim, this is the most important thing in my life. This is all there is. And I'm, I'm not talking about an in-your-face type of, of argument. I, I think the church has tried some of that and it, it didn't bode well within the world. But I'm also not talking about covert ops to where no one even knows about your, your faith relationship with the Lord. We had a family that uh, went to this church several years ago, and they lived about 30, 35 minutes out. And as their children got ready to go into the middle school program, they made a decision, even though they loved this congregation, that they wanted their, their children to be in a youth group with peers from school. And so they, they bit the bullet and decided to attend another church. And so this summer I had the opportunity to connect with him just to see how things were going. And he said, well, it was the wildest thing when I walked into church. He said that the first Sunday we walked in, he said, one of the guys that I've worked almost side by side for the past seven years was a shepherd at that church. He goes, I didn't even know he was a Christian, and he didn't know that I was. And he was excited that he, he was telling me how wonderful it is. He found out different believers in his work environment. I was discouraged. But you've got a core member of this church and an elder of another church that worked side by side for seven years and neither knew not only that they're a member of Church of Christ, that they had a relationship with their, our Heavenly Father. I understand that in, in school and in in our neighborhoods and we've got to watch it and be careful how we put in a good word for the lord but we've got to put that word in it should not be a shock to those that have lived next to us for years that we're believers the guy sharing the cubicle should know jesus christ is the center of my life that's what everything else revolves around because if he doesn't we're not being faithful messengers of the gift God has given us. We just aren't. You know, Paul was not one of the most uh, eloquent uh, of, of, of people, but he gets out there and, and he shares, and he said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. But we've got to, even though it's not us that do it, it we're the ones that are casting this, which leads us to, Man, our, our, our second point is we're called to fear the master more than we dread his enemies. We just have to look around. We, we can't straddle the fence anymore. If we're united with God, it's going to mean we're going to have a hard time being united with the ways of the world. Well, one thing, Jesus doesn't stand for it, but the world doesn't either. I don't know if you've noticed. There is a real pressure for you to be part of the status quo there's a, a, a pressure for you to think and, and laugh at the same jokes and to do the same things on vacation and, and, and to act in certain ways. And if you step up and say, that's not me, there's friction there. But we've got to fear the master more than we dread our enemies. You know, the servant who had hit his mina was not dismissed. Instead, he was judged unfaithful. At end of all, what was given to him was taken away. One of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I, I'm really a, a firm believer that if you're kind of wrestling between which world, 
that you, you really haven't spent a whole lot of time with God. Because what I'm finding is, the, the more I understand about God, and it, it's a lifelong journey of discipleship, the more time I spend with Him, the, the less some of the voices in the world, that volume gets turned down, doesn't it? As we're turning up God, it, it, a lot of that just doesn't matter anymore. The things and, and the popularity, I know it's tough. Middle school, man, it's, it's tough. It's next to hell. It, it, it's it's going to get better. You'll get through middle school and high school. As your identity becomes more in Christ, it doesn't matter what the guy across the cafeteria thinks about you. It, it doesn't. But that, that requires us to know the master and spend time with him. And the, the final thing is, as far as evangelism, number three, we've we are called to trust the power of the master's gift. I'm, I'm going to let, let you off the hook on something. If you're bringing someone to the Lord, it really has a very little to do with you. It's just more about giving them the gospel message. That's where the power is. You know, I'm, I'm flattered when people come up or they'll send me an email and say, man, I, I really appreciate that, that message or, man, that, that class really helped me and stuff. And my standard response is, that was a powerful passage, a powerful text we looked at this morning. The, I don't want any amens. The, the power is not in the vessel. It, it's not. The, the power comes in, in the text, in what God has done, and how he's inspired these authors, and what the Spirit does with that proclamation. How am I convinced of this? Sometimes you guys will come up, when you said this, this, and this, oh, that hit me. I'm like, I didn't say that. But the Spirit took something and worked with you and spoke a word. That's God's power. And we have to realize that's exciting. A lot of times we'll say, well, I've got this friend, but I don't really know what to say. Just start talking and let God do it. He, he promises he's going to put those words in there. The power is not in the vessel. The, the power is what's in the vessel that comes from our Heavenly Father as it spills out. We, we, we've got to trust the power of the Master's gift. You know, a British journalist once asked Mother Teresa how she kept going, knowing that she could never meet all the needs of the dying there in Calcutta. Here's what she had to say. She said, I'm not called to be successful. I'm just called to be faithful. And that, that, that has to be where we are. We can be overwhelmed by the number of, of, of people that, that don't know the Lord, or we can say, but I've got a relationship with this guy at the gym. I'll put in a good word and see what God does with it. We have to believe in, in the power of that. You know, as we continue to live in the days absent, the noblemen, I, I just have to encourage us that unlike those servants in the parable, we know how this turns out. It, it's not still up, well, is the forces of evil or the forces of, of God going to win? That victory's done. That's written in the books. We're living on the other side of the cross. Praise the Lord. We have to realize God has already crowned his son king. And that king is coming back. And that should drive everything that we do. You know, from a very early age, we sing that song, This Little Light of Mine. And, you know, the last verse is hide it under a bushel. No. And so as kids, we're like, yeah, no way. And we get in there, we're like, well... Okay, yeah, but high school is hard. Being a young adult is, well, that, that's hard too. And, well, if you're going to make it in the business world, it's kind of hard. And we, we start getting pretty proficient about that. God doesn't want us to take the gifts he's given us, wrap it up during the week, and then unwrap it on Sunday and say, isn't that gift great? And then wrap it right back up. God's calling us to be bold. Let's pray together. Lord, we truly believe that you are our king. Unlike the nobleman, Lord, you've already been crowned. Lord, help us to realize that. Help us to be willing subjects. And may those around us know where our allegiance lies. Lord, by our actions, by our words, how our families interact, how our marriages are different. Lord, our, our work ethic, the way that we walk down the schools at, and in high school, Lord, I, I just pray people can look over every aspect of our life. And Lord, we're, we're not going to be perfect, but they know where our allegiance lies. Lord, I pray that you fill us up and reign in each one of us. 
We ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Stand together. Oh.